Okay, so um, it's very lovely to be here. Um, I would say the Sangam team invited me, but actually I invited myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I knew that we were going around the Mandala and that there was an opportunity to um, uh, talk about Pandravasani, I said, I'd like to do that, please. And here I am. Um, yes, so... Uh, I first encountered her back sometime around 2004 when uh, Vasantra, who some of you may have heard about, one of our senior uh, meditation teachers, he um, had been on a fairly long solitary retreat and during which time he was uh, reflecting on these pranyas, who are, which is the name for the female um, deities or the female concepts of the male Buddhas, the jinnas. And during that time, he uh, wrote their sadhanas or their invocations and also wrote some pujas, which I will be using some of the verses from later. Um, and then shortly after that, uh, when he emerged, he then led a series of retreats over five years at Rivendell. And I went on every single one. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I really see it now as a very key kind of formative experience because it was really so, um, the, it was so immersive. So we, we Rivendell, I don't know if people know, but it's just a beautiful, very English in Sussex, Surrey-ish somewhere. Um, it's in an old vicarage and beautiful cultivated gardens and really old trees. So we did lots of ritual outside with all the elements and um, as well as lots of practice in the shrine room. So it was very much um, an opportunity to really get a direct sort of palpable taste of what the qualities of enlightenment might be like, what it might be like to transform some of the poisons that each of these figures represents um, to become enlightened or awakened. So it was very, very important. And um, yeah, so the first retreat blew my mind. Um, yeah, I'd never had the experience before then of being so fully immersed in the richness, myth, beauty, and symbolism of a mandala. Um, and where we move from east to south, west to north, and then into the center. So a bit like we're mirroring here in our year at the Buddhist Center in Bristol, we're moving around. And it takes you on very much on a journey um, I've already talked about R uh, Rivendell. So the shrines were meticulously created by um, a New Zealander who lives, lived in London at that time called Mike Trivadri, um, with incredible attention to detail. And um, uh, I tried to sort of, she really deeply inspired me in terms of shrine creation, even e in terms of how the details matter. And um, to the extent that on this shrine, the offering bowls that had the sand in for the incense were actually dyed with food colouring to represent the colour of that particular pranya whose realm we were in. So there was just an exquisite attention to detail. Um, and as I mentioned, we also did rituals outside with each of the elements of the pranyas. So with Panda of Asani, there was a huge roaring fire under the starlit night. Uh, when we were chanting her mantra, making offerings and sort of towering flames on her transmuting presence. So walk, this is on the very first retreat when I first encountered her. I walked into the shrine room a few days into the retreat and Panda Vasani was starting to appear. They sort of did it in a very gradual way. So you started with a collar. And the, I walked into the shrine room, the rear wall, literally almost the whole wall, probably not quite as wide as our wall here, had red like the colour of the bottom of that tanker. Re vibrant red, 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 hung uh, cloth hanging down all along the back wall. And um, ceiling to the floor. And the red, in its unequivocal presence and force of impact, literally walloped me in the solar plexus. It was just like... <laughs> um, and I thought I might be sick. It was like really keen strong impact and that was before she even appeared um but again just the impact of color and how much that that uh, affects us in, in many ways 
So it was weird because it was almost too intense. Like I said, I got this real sort of nauseous aversion kind of feeling. Whoa, that's too much. And at the same time, I just felt like, whoa, I want to move towards this. So, and later when I learned that she's to do with what we call the right of fascination, um, that made a lot of sense. And if you think about fires, they're often, they've got that sort of quality to them. We want to sort of gaze into the fire and they, they draw us in. So she's got that quality. She's, she's drawing us in. So I had, so she very much drew me in. <laughs> and then um, after a day of sort of meditating on them and talking about symbol, actually, I don't remember much discursive talking. It was more, more meditation and, and practice that way. But anyway, we had the puja. Uh, which, as I said, Ratanja had written, and which I'll do in full in a few weeks' time at Sanganite. Um, Maitri Vadri, who I mentioned as the shrine, shrine creator, led us through the invocation of Pandra Vasani, uh, in which we were introduced to her, if you like. Um, and at one point, she described Pandra Vasani as looking straight at you with eyes of compassion. And again, in the terrain of strong responses, I immediately had a sense of needing to hide. It was just too much. It was a bit like that response to the red. It's like, no, I, I cannot be seen by her, even though it's eyes of compassion. Um, and I, in the sort of imaginative world of meditation, I, I, I found that a shroud came down over my face uh, to, to, in a way, protect me so that she couldn't see me. It was just too terrifying, just too terrifying to be seen, um, even with eyes, even by the eyes of a Buddha uh, who was dwelling in nothing but deep acceptance and compassion. In a way, that was the point. I couldn't bear to be seen. So it was a very strong response and very real and direct. And at dinner, I mentioned this to Maitri Vatri, and she smiled and she said gently, well, she can see through the shroud. <laughs> Which terrified me even more. Because ah! <laughs> she's the Buddha, so of course she can see through the shroud. <laughs> anyway, to cut a very long story short, my first encounter with her was a bit like the stories that we hear in the Pali Canon, where the most difficult disciple is often the biggest teacher. And my relationship with her has really been true of that. A journey from terrified, incapacitated shyness through to utter reverence and surrender. An emergence from shyness and a kind of nihilistic self-view that I don't matter, I don't exist. Through to real capacity to stand in my own red nerve <laughs> and being seen in all my uniqueness. <laughs> I will have a flower from my... <laughs> um, so her wisdom is that of transforming craving into discriminating wisdom. The capacity to see the uniqueness of all phenomena, hence the being seen being such a strong part of my experience with her. Um, and to bring it a bit more up to date, unbeknown to me at the time, which was nearly 20 years ago, um, it, I now know that I actually have Asperger's, uh, which I was diagnosed with sometime before the pandemic. And so I think in writing this talk, I thought, oh, that's really interesting because the more that I've understood about autism and neurodiversity for women is that often um, women and, and girls are very able and good at what they call masking. So masking their difference in order to fit in with the context they're in. It's very easy to learn the sort of social cues. Oh, OK, that's how I need to behave. So I think I was pretty good at that. <laughs> um, so the shroud, if you like, that obscured also a hope to my face, I can now see as a form of masking. Um, so it's interesting that I had all of that going on, uh, even though I didn't know about the neurodiversity um, aspect of my experience. So the mystery of the Dharma and how these things are somehow known through unconscious arisings and symbolism from the depths, through meditation or through ritual. So I'm still learning how to stand in my uniqueness and to be seen in it, um, which I can be quite passionate, <laughs> uh, playful and quirky. And um, 
yeah, it's an edge without rushing to put the mask back on. And I'm sure that the idea of the mask is something we can all resonate with to an extent. Um, it's that mix of sort of longing to be seen, hence the craving, which is to do with transforming that craving. They long to be seen, long to be known, long to be loved anyway, no matter how I might be. And yet at the same time, absolutely terrified of what that might do, how that might be for me. So in fact, my relationship with her was so intense, meaningful and supportive over the next five years. Yes, I did do the retreat every year for five years, including a couple which were actually solely about Pandoravatani, that I commissioned this painting from Arloka, who's um, somebody in our order who's an artist who's been doing, actually he painted our Buddha tank and painting mm -hmm. behind Amitabha. And he said, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but he said he'd never seen, he'd never had anyone offer so much explanation from their direct experience of the figure through meditation and ritual to the, um, in terms of, because I had to send him, you know, how I, what my experience of her was and how I, how I wanted her to manifest. Obviously, it's quite a leap of faith because, but I still wanted to communicate something. Um, and then, it, yeah, just a very mysterious creative process of sharing some of my meditation experiences manifesting in this painting here. So there is, of course, a whole other talk I could give about that. And in the after meditation, uh, and in the meditation after tea, I will just draw out a few aspects of that symbolism in this particular painting that really resonated with me. So you can see how the experience may land in your being. Um, oh, that's the end. Oh. No, it isn't. I've read the wrong page. I keep doing this. You did that when we... I did. <laughs> what am I like? You see, you can make mistakes and it's still okay. I'm going back to... I haven't learned my lesson. I should put numbers on them. Okay, I'm going back to Sanger. So that was the end. Okay. <laughs> and now I'm going back. <laughs> and so didn't clap yet. Didn't clap yet. <laughs> so uh, I think this is where it led on. The wisdom is that of transforming craving into discriminating wisdom. Mm. Um. Oh, that's, yes, yeah. Sangharachita has said, in a sense, that all craving is what we call, what, what he calls the long circuiting of the desire for enlightenment. When we experience awakening, all desires are satisfied. So I thought that was, um, right, I'm going to stop now because I'm making a hash. I had got to the end. <laughs> So yes, that's it, and that didn't take very long at all. So what I would suggest we do is, if we settle, we can have some more meditation, and just if you want to um, have a look. I mean, it's quite, when Naira Vera and I were putting these up earlier, making this shrine, we were both talking about how strikingly different mm. the images are, weren't we? And how, um, well, in mine, it felt like there was a real... Quite, quite, it feels quite dynamic and the, like there's lots of energy, whereas mm -hmm. in Kumida's painting, she's, it seems much more serene, although her white robe is sort of glowing and almost moving, the edges are slightly quivering, mm -hmm. so it's almost like, um, yeah, it's, they're just very different, and I think that was very, um, it's very interesting to see that. Um, I'm actually wondering, given that we've got so much time, what I might do is do the bit that I thought I'd do later, and then we can have more of a meditative sign time after the break. Just say, yes, that's good. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah, Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Chandranishta. <laughs> <laughs> so the symbolism... Um, 
so uh, on my painting, it was really, really crucial for me that the phoenix was there. Partly because of a childhood fascination with the phoenix and the carpet. I don't know if you meant people remember that book, but in the 1970s it was turned into a television programme, which I, television, children's television series, utterly fascinated by. Um, and the phoenix is uh, the animal that the Santra felt was to be associated with Panda of Arsene. They've each got their own animals and they're not always included, um, as you can see, but in mine it felt really important. And largely because uh, obviously there's the association with the fire, the phoenix that rises from the fires, and symbolising the transformation and the unmasking that I talked about and the journey to become a true individual. Um, her fingers, her hands, are what we are in the uh, mudra of what's called the Anjali gesture, which is the gesture of devotion. And she reverences the Dharma. So she's got her fingers like that together. So your steepled fingers express your ardent devotion for truth itself. To you, the white robed queen, clad in the snow of pure renunciation, clad in the white heat of profound concentration, clad in the white light of ultimate reality. And again, something for me felt really quite uh, significant about the fact that she's got this um, white sort of, it doesn't quite look like a cloak there, but wrapping round her, she's in Panda of Arsene, the white robed queen. And um, again, for me, that was quite important because it was something about the intensity of the fire that I could experience like an intense meditation and absorption. And if I really let my heart open and I really fell into those qualities of enlightenment, it could feel a bit much and a bit... So there's something about the juxtaposition of that with the containing of the, the robe. And she's very much to do with meditation. She sits in meditation posture with her legs in full lotus and again that was very sim resonant for me because I'm quite a always my way in has definitely been meditation so this really again she really uh, demonstrated or reflected that quality of absorption and the intensity of that energy and yet how that can be contained in a meditation posture or in silence now I understand that all my longing was for your undying state Please teach me what love really is. Teach me what happiness really is. Teach me what life really is. Please teach me to crave only freedom. And the fact that she she uh, has this potential by dwelling on her, calling on her, meditating on her, reciting verses in her uh, in reverence to her, all can help to transmute this craving um, into this into the wisdom discriminating uh, wisdom um, that sees the uniqueness and everything um, and that was really important for me that was the bit I mentioned earlier when we experience awakening all desires are satisfied from the ashes of my failings may I be reborn on wings of light reverence to the phoenix and I'll just read you a poem that Vasantra wrote actually on one of our retreats called the prayer of the phoenix bowing its feathered head before the roaring flames the phoenix utters its ancient prayer homage to the great fire the time has come, the moment has arrived. I shall leave behind this old beak that pecks constantly at what no longer nourishes. This old voice that croaks the same stale song. These old wings that have forgotten how to soar, flapping feebly back and forth over familiar territory. 
I approach this fire with a mind of faith. I embrace this fire with a fearless heart. I endure this fire with a patient spirit. Through this death, I shall find new life. Through this heat, I shall cool my mind. Through this suffering, I shall find great bliss. In this fire, I shall forge my freedom.